Hey everybody, Bob Babbitt here. This is Challenged Athletes Live. Our next guest, Mr. Max Conserva joins us. Max, how you doing? I'm doing good, Bob. How you doing? Wonderful. So in this day and age of Zoom classes, you, you were not doing Zoom adaptive athletic classes before the whole COVID thing. How big a part of your life has that become? Well, as an athletic trainer, I spend probably 70% of my time on Zoom these days. So it's a huge part. Take me back. You're yeah. gr growing up, eight years old. Car accident? Is that what happened? Uh, I was on my bike and I got hit by a giant truck. 1989. Wow. And but you didn't have your leg amputated. What right. were what were the injuries? Uh, so I got what's called a degloving injury or a, a limb salvage. So I was drug on my side. So I sustained damage from my calf all the way up to my thigh. And uh, it was a kind of sideways injury. So I lost part of my leg this way as opposed to up and down the leg. Had, did they talk about amputation? I think they did briefly. But um, I think with anybody that gets, gets a limb injury, there's a conversation of, are they going to be better off trying to save the limb versus keeping the limb? And in my case, they tried to save the limb, and they did a good job of it. So how many operations did you have to endure? Um, 15, maybe. I can't even remember at this point. Wow. And, and being an eight-year-old kid and basically spending so much time in and out of hospitals, how yeah. tough was that on you in terms of just being able to, to be a kid? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think going I've, – I've worked with so many athletes with chronic injuries or injuries when they're young – it can really affect people all kinds of different ways. And for me, I think superficially, every, I did well. I did very well. I responded well. Um, however, I didn't recognize there was kind of some baggage that I was holding on to um, the entire time. So, for example, when I was young, I thought I got car sick. Like, I thought that was a thing. And, uh, and because I throw up on car trips sometimes. But I realized the only car trips I'd throw up on is when I was going to the hospital in the morning. And that was because my body was so rejecting the experience. My mom would have to pull over and I'd have to throw up just driving down the freeway. And when, and when I was young, that's what I, I took it to mean. And it wasn't until I was older that I realized that I had so much anxiety around going to the hospital, being in the hospital, going through surgery and recovering that my body subconsciously was just rejecting the entire experience. So even though you know, I did well, there were some things that took me kind of 30 years to unwind. Did, were you able to play sports after this happened? Uh, yeah, off and on. Um, it was kind of a fight to take care of myself and then wanting to be a kid. Uh, my injury left me in a position where my limb was you know, fragile so I steered away from a lot of sports and I was in Southern California at the time. So I ended up doing kind of a lot of solo stuff like uh, skateboarding was huge in Southern California. So that's what I did with my friends. And, and actually, as I got older, I moved into snowboarding again. It was kind of a solitary um, non-team sport, non-competitive sport. And uh, I actually played to my strengths in a lot of ways. I don't want to get too technical. No, yeah. Here, but uh but actually it was something I was able to do and able to do at a pretty high level um, that uh, I got a lot of enjoyment out of. So uh, you're going through physical therapy and yeah. you must have gotten to a point where you're going, I don't feel like I'm getting any better from this. I feel like I'm going in, I'm, they're, they're talking about all sorts of different things. I'm doing different exercises. But uh, when did you get to the point where you felt like, I don't know if I'm improving from all this other stuff I'm doing? Yeah. You know, physical therapy, I think it's, it, it, I don't think it's the physical therapist's decision for it to be this way, but it takes you from bad to passable in terms of, of living. You know, when you get out of a surgery or you have been sitting in a bed for three months, I mean, the effects in your body are real and it's really difficult to take those first steps again. It's really difficult to stand up and sit down again. Um, and physical therapists are phenomenal and our healthcare system is great at getting you kind of to that place where you can get from your bed to the refrigerator. But when the conversation then turns from, okay, I can, I can get around, um, I can kind of take care of myself on a very basic level, but I don't want to just be okay or passable. I want to be 
normal at least and going from you know their normal or normal to good at anything with your body physical therapy just is not the they they're they're not the venue to do that unfortunately so i hit a wall pretty quickly i mean i did physical therapy after my operations and then after that it was kind of like i just have to figure everything out on my own when did you get to the point where you decided to really embrace this and go okay i i can create something better than this i've i've seen the bracing that you have yeah. on your leg and i don't think that came from outside that that was you creating yeah. something when did you take ownership of that and decide i need to control my own destiny here yeah it wasn't until 20 something years after my my condition uh, to over two decades um i just got to a point where you know i, I recognized that my condition was going to stay the same and frankly just deteriorate the older i got um, and no one was going to come and fix it for me. And that was nobody's job to do that. So I had to um, invest myself in the process as much as I possibly could to affect change. And that's what I started doing with designing my equipment and then ultimately designing my own strength and conditioning to, uh, to move, to find some tools to actually move myself forward. Was there a, as you were growing up, was it hard for you to wear shorts? Were you a guy who wore the long pants because you really didn't oh, yeah. want people to see? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So even though, again, like I did well with my condition um, in, a, in a lot of respects, um, it was a huge source of uh, shame for me. Um, something I always felt I needed to compensate for, make up for, hide. You know, in it's natural as social creatures, um, I think the biggest way we operate in this world is you look to the left of you and look to the right of you and evaluate what other people are doing and compare yourself to how they're operating in every respect, you know, professionally, academically, physically, socially. And when you feel like you fall short, you know, when you have a deformed limb or a missing limb or your body doesn't move the same way as other people, um, and you don't feel like you have any way to, to actually change that. I think it's a very natural reaction to try to hide that. And I stopped wearing shorts in high school and uh, did not wear them again until my 30s. Wow. Yeah. And you've created uh, adaptive athletic. Uh, obviously, yeah. there's a point where you took control of your own life and took control of, of getting as healthy as humanly possible. When did you get to the point where you felt like, you know what? This has worked for me. Yeah. I think there's a lot of other people out there who could use this same type of empowerment. Yeah. So I, I, I began to volunteer um, to work with individuals that had some kind of problem. And right away, I recognized, I mean, frankly, working with standard athletes as well, um, or standard individuals, the bottom line is if there's something about your body that you want to change physically, you need to be training. There's no other modality or methodology with which to address these things. If you're unhappy with the way your body feels, the way it looks, or the way it performs, training is the language of improvement. Um, I mean, once again, once you get out of the hospital and once you get out of the you know, non-functional to barely passable, everything beyond that falls in the realm of training. Um, and so even though you know, you could say I do a pretty, I have a pretty difficult profession, whereas I take people with all manner of physical, orthopedic and neurological issues, and I work with them in a training environment. The fundamental root of what we're working on is, where are you at physically? Like, how can you operate your body in the world? And how, can we set up a training plan that if you follow, you'll get better at doing those things. And, and then that basic template, um, it's, you know, very, very simple process. When I watch video and I watched Antonia yeah. and you see somebody going from a wheelchair to, crutch, to two crutches, to one crutch, yeah. and you know what that's doing for her, not just physically, but emotionally. Yeah. Uh, from your perspective as a guy who's leading her there, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. Um, the... You know, it, Physical, um, a physical practice was deeply meaningful to me. And I think anybody can relate that if you have a very, you derive meaning from something in life, um, you'll derive additional meaning by showing other people that source of meaning. And 
you know, the X's and O's of this, of the movement are what kind of got me in. I was very interested in, okay, can I improve? Can I reduce my own back pain? Can I make myself more athletic? Can I run? Can I hike? Can I jump higher? And that's where I got started, but immediately it became apparent that what I was really, the real gains for myself were, can I take something that I used to be ashamed of and make it something I'm proud of? And that, that dichotomy or that progression works for anybody. Um, and and uh, yeah, when you discover something like that and you can share it with other people, it's, it's uh, I lost, all passion for previous things that I did. Now, what was your profession before you decided to go into helping other people? Um, I was a corporate strategy consultant, um, uh, consulting private equity firms uh, for private placement of capital. And then I started a company in, uh, in um, uh, uh, inventory liquid liquidation logistics um, after that. Um, so yeah, I was an engineer in college, totally, totally different stuff. And, uh, when I got out of that business to take a break is when I turned my focus towards my own body and then ultimately towards, towards other people's bodies. And it just became much more fascinating for me. So when you look at the success stories of the athletes you work with, yeah, share a couple of the success stories of somebody who came to you and was really at a really low point. Didn't know if they could, uh, could achieve anything physically and what the path was to get them to where they're at now. Yeah, uh, so without uh, naming any names, you know, I have uh, some athletes that have been working with me for, you know, since I, since I started this for about four years. Um, and the, you know, I, I've gone from taking individuals and working on things that they otherwise did not think they could do. So something as simple as getting up and down off the floor in a way that is, um, that a way that exudes grace and dignity as opposed to a kind of Hail Mary attempt at, at um, and display of, of global decrepitude, um, you know, and that's the, that's, that is the, and you know, frankly, this is something that I, I deal with a lot with everybody. I, I tell everybody you're only as old as it looks for you to sit down on the floor and stand back up again. So this is a problem with, you know, everybody to a certain extent. Um, but in, in functional fitness world, that would come down to being a burpee. So, you know, working with someone to figure out how do we take this difficult and very human thing of just getting onto the floor and getting off the floor and um, turn it into an athletic endeavor and going from not being able to do this movement without props, you know, without having to hold on to something or have somebody help you or grab onto something. But even if one of your arms does not work and one of your legs does not work, can we craft a strategy where you can actually turn this into a plyometric movement, use what you build up, what doesn't work as much as possible and really strengthen what does work and turn it into kind of superhuman. So we can get to the point that you can not only get up and down off the ground and be confident about it, but you can do it 50 times, you know, in the course of 15 minutes or, or a hundred times and do it alongside somebody else where this is also a very difficult thing for them. Um, so those are the things I'm always most proud of. When did you connect with Challenge Athletes Foundation? Oh man, first instance is tough to say. You know, I think it might have been um, you guys did a joint kind of triathlon clinic with UCSF up in Northern California. Yep. And I want to say I participated in it and did did some of the events and I met a few of the individuals. I met some of the um, board of directors folks, Alan Chankin at the time, you know, he was out there and we got talking and he became one of my clients, actually my first client ever. And then through building our relationship, he, um, you know, showed me Challenge Athletes Foundation. I went down actually and I did SDTC and did the swim for it. And I decided that I would do the swim in SDTC. SDTC and then do that as preparation to do an Alcatraz swim. 
And so um, actually when I did that swim, that was part of my own process where it was the first time um, I walked out in public without my brace on. Really? Yeah. So, you know, going back to the previous discussion about, you know, not wearing shorts, you know, I got to a point where I, when I walked into CrossFit, when I started, I was wearing track pants and eventually I got over that and I'd start to wear shorts. But even then my, my leg is pretty covered up and my deformity is somewhat ameliorated by the hardware I wear. You know, you, it's like, you know, having your, if you have an amputation, having your stump exposed versus having a, a prosthetic on, I think there's some level of discomfort the further you go down that hole. And walking out in SDTC, even though I was in a wetsuit, walking without my, without my brace, which immediately makes obvious how disabled I am and how crooked my leg is and how skinny it is and how my foot isn't pointed in the right direction and my knee's not bending the right way. So doing that walk down to the cove was the first time I'd ever done that. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. And that led to to me, um, you know, what was one of the seminal events for me in, uh, in dedicating myself to work with individuals with, uh, with these kind of issues. Well, especially because when you're at Standing a Triathlon Challenge, you're seeing 150 other people like you, who totally. are, you know, you know, they're amputees, they're wheelchair bound, paraplegics, quadriplegics, legs laying all over the place. Yeah. It's, at that point, it's, it's a lot easier to go, okay, this is, this, these are my people, and yeah. uh, there's a lot of us out here. Yeah, yeah, and there's so much to that. It's it's a really deep way to think about things. I think it it also really takes the attention off any one individual. And I think on a personal level, realize realize makes you know at a certain point, I realize like the world does not revolve around me. Nobody cares. Everybody's got their own problems to deal with. There's other people next to me with their own problems to deal with. Everybody in the crowd has their own stuff to deal with. Nobody cares. Um, and and even more, if they do care, it's like, I don't really have the time to deal with you. I have my things to deal with, I have the time to, you know, to deal with your stuff. Um, and also the other thing I've really realized over this journey is that, and I think it's even more present now in this pandemic, is the role of culture in overcoming, you know, difficult situations or just coping with chronic long-term problems. I think as human beings, we're not built to overcome difficult tasks um, by ourselves. I think we historically and evolutionarily have created cultures around how to do hard things and um, overcoming physical issues, uh, training, for example, we have gyms, they exist, coaches exist, you know, uh, competition exists, cooperation exists, all those facets are mechanisms we can use to build a culture around what otherwise is tremendously difficult. Training in your basement by yourself for years, it might be possible theoretically, but there's a very small percentage of people that are going to actually be able to do that. In reality, we should all be looking for ways to make this not only doable, but enjoyable. You know, a, a sense of shared struggle, a, a sense of overcoming things for the group, you know, beyond yourself, as opposed to just for yourself. Those are deep sources of meaning that we can draw on. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I, I, I recognize that that's why some of the stuff doesn't work in the clinical setting, like a physical therapy office, again, no credit, no disparagement to the professionals in there. Um, it's just, it's a very abstract and clinical environment when the reality is we need a training environment, a yes. infinite game that we're playing to constantly check in with our body, find the next obstacle, create a plan, and then work hard to get there knowing there's going to be another one tomorrow and the obstacles are never going to end. We need to have very strong culture to be able to adapt and thrive in an environment like that. I love it. Hey, Max, thanks so much for taking time and, and thanks for what you're doing. It just you talk about culture. You don't just talk about it. You've created it. What you're doing uh, up in Northern Cal and I can see this happening. Well, through Zoom, you're working with athletes all over the world. Yeah. That's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, absolutely. Max, we, we love having you part of our CAF family. Thanks so much for taking time. Absolutely, Bob. A pleasure. Max Conserva has been a guest. This has been Challenged Athletes Live. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.